Thanks for finding us and welcome to Markham Baptist Church as we take time to intentionally listen and to open our lives to the presence and gifts of God. If you're watching today and needing to feel more connected or perhaps more hopeful than perhaps you feel right now, know that we'd welcome you as part of our church family. And if you would like us to pray for you about a concern or need, please let us know. Our building is still closed to assure the health and safety of others during COVID. However, please send us an email or leave a message and we'll respond as soon as possible and include you in our prayers this week. A love that never ceases, a creativity that designed the universe, a hope that cannot be quenched, a pursuit of reconciliation no matter the cost. These are the things that are of God. So let's worship God today. Would you bow with me now in prayer? Let's pray. O oh God of creation and artistic sunrise greetings, of choirs of robins and finch and sparrow, the rhythm percussion of the breeze, the tempo set by spring rains. We rejoice in this day, a day that you've made for us to be alive in. And in our aliveness, O oh God, we offer you praise and give you the glory. You invite us forward despite our fears and misgivings about what else might greet us next. But replace those fears and hesitations with the confidence elicited by grace. Find us today hopeful, expectant of your healing and your holy touch, because today we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Good morning. Today's Old Testament reading comes from Psalm 29. Ascribe to the Lord, O heavenly beings, ascribe to the Lord glory and strength. Ascribe to the Lord the glory of his name. Worship the Lord in holy splendor. The voice of the Lord is over the waters. The God of glory thunders. The Lord over mighty waters. The voice of the Lord is powerful. The voice of the Lord is full of majesty. The voice of the Lord breaks the cedars. The Lord breaks the cedars of Lebanon. He makes Lebanon skip like a calf and Syrian like a young wild ox. The voice of the Lord flashes forth flames of fire. The voice of the Lord shakes the wilderness. The Lord shakes the wilderness of Kadesh. The voice of the Lord causes the oaks to whirl and stripes the forest bare. And in his temple all say glory. The Lord sits enthroned over the flood. The Lord sits enthroned as king forever. May the Lord give strength to his people. May the Lord bless his people with peace. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. In the presence of a holy God, I bow down. of my heart and I 
it might I'm so small and frail and weak When I see your power and wisdom, Lord I have no words left to speak In the presence of your glory crowns lie in the dust. You are righteous in your judgments, Lord. You are faithful, true, and just. And I cry Today we're reading from Romans 8, 12 to 17. So then, brothers and sisters, we are debtors, not to the flesh, to live according to the flesh, for if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. For all who are led to the Spirit of God are children of God. For you did not receive a spirit of slavery to fall back into fear but you have received a spirit of adoption. When we cry, Abba, Father, it is that very spirit bearing witness with our spirit that we are children of God. And if children, then hers. Hers of God, and join hers of Christ. If in fact, we suffer with him so that we may also be glorified with him. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. News about the rich and famous is everywhere. It's the mainstay of the tabloids, and it's the stuff of Netflix miniseries. To have the problem of wondering how to spend all that money. One of the latest stories to capture the attention of much of the world is the divorce of Bill and Melinda Gates. It's sad news, and yet it keeps the audience and readers coming back for more. Apparently, neither will struggle financially. Their combined worth is said to be somewhere north of $130 billion. Much of it part of a foundation. And much of that used for very good causes. Vaccines for the global south, millions invested in schools, hospitals, health care, research, and fighting poverty. They've helped encourage some of the world's wealthiest people and corporations to give something back. 
not giving it completely away as Jesus invited the rich young ruler to do in the Gospels, but, but certainly a large chunk of it. And then there's the story of an inheritance and mind-boggling tax bill for the heirs of the Samsung electronics fortune. Apparently, they're having a hard time coming up with the cash to pay the $10 billion owed in inheritance tax. Thankfully, it's reported that they have a few Monets and Picassos that they can put out at the next yard sale. You may not have millions stashed away, but perhaps, perhaps you've received a modest inheritance at some point in your life. You know how it helps you to pay bills or rent or the mortgage and somewhat reduces the level of anxiety. You might not be able to afford a chauffeur or ride around in a Rolls Royce, but, but you know that the car you're driving in now will hopefully make it to the grocery store the next time you need a run for milk and eggs. Inheritances, generally speaking, bring more confidence, choices, and security. The Apostle Paul, writing to the Christians in Rome, says that we are children of God, and if children, then heirs, heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ. Paul's talking about the inheritance that every follower of Jesus Christ receives. There is none bigger, greater, or better. Our legacy gives us not only a greater confidence and security for the times and the world that we're living in, but it is also the one inheritance that will never, ever fail. Jesus describes it this way in Matthew 6, verses 19 through 21. He says, don't hoard treasure down here where it gets eaten up by moths and corroded by rust or worse, stolen by burglars. Stockpile treasure in heaven where it's safe from moth and rust and burglars. It's obvious, isn't it? The place where your treasure is, is the place you most want to be and end up being. It's our legacy in Christ that guarantees a future when none seem possible and gives us hope when all else fails. When it came to filling in the rental agreement for my first apartment, my roommates and I had to find someone to serve as a guarantor, someone the landlord could trust to come up with the money if we defaulted. Thankfully, we found someone and never had to call on him to bail us out. But, but had we not had that guarantor, the management company would not have given three broke students in their mid-twenties that apartment. We didn't qualify on our own. We didn't have what was needed to get in. Paul says that the Holy Spirit himself is the guarantor of our eternal inheritance that it's the spirit that intercedes for us when it seems our prayers may be bouncing off the ceiling. No matter how sinful we are, no matter how unworthy we may feel, no matter how stuck we are to find the words that we really want to say to God, the Holy Spirit hears our cry and speaks up on our behalf. It's the Holy Spirit that, that removes any doubt, allowing us to realize that God hears our prayer. It's the Holy Spirit that reminds us that we can approach the maker of heaven and earth, not as some unworthy or unknown stranger, but rather as a member of the family invited closer so that we can share our heart with the one whom God, who Paul calls Abba, Father. It's that very spirit bearing witness with our spirit that we're children of God. And if children, Scripture says, then, then heirs, heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ. We can look forward to one day sharing in His glory, Scripture says. The latter part of verse 17, by the way, puts it this way. Heirs of God, joint heirs with Christ, if in fact we suffer with Him, so that we may also be glorified with Him. The Reformed theologian Reinhold Niebuhr suggested that the responsibility of every preacher is to comfort the afflicted and afflict the comfortable. There are two sides to the Christian gospel. On the one hand, it's comforting news to know that we who are saved by grace, having put our faith in Jesus Christ, that we have this inheritance that will not go the way of other temporal things. It won't tarnish or rust away or be taken from us. That should give us a good dose of daily confidence. We will see and share in the glory of God someday. But there's something else that we can't hide from. 
Along with the comfort the gospel gives us amid our many afflictions, including sin, guilt, and worry, to name a few, we are also afflicted in a way by the gospel of Christ. Our natural comforts are appropriately assaulted when we are truly following Jesus Christ. These words of comfort by Paul to the Christians in Rome do not appear out of nowhere. They, they rise up out of the accumulated experiences of his own journey in faith. Paul risked everything for Christ. In Philippians 3 verse 10, he reminds us that he gave up all that inferior stuff so that he could know Christ personally, experience his resurrection power, and be a partner in his suffering and go all the way with him to death itself. Paul had risked security, reputation, and friends, life itself for the sake of Christ. In her commentary on Romans, Fleming Rutledge makes this bold statement. She says, if there's one thing that I hope to do before I die, it is to pass on at least to a few people the fact that the Christian faith is revolutionary. Blessed are the meek. Did you ever hear anything more audacious than that? Here's something else. You can find it in Matthew 19, verse 29, where it says, everyone who has left houses or family or lands for my sake, Jesus' sake, will inherit eternal life. That's the exact opposite of what some refer to as the American dream. To acquire a house which seems further and further out of the reach of more and more people. To have a family which in these times seems to be an act of courage and defiance. To steward the land we're given and inherit when so much of it is being bulldozed for profit. Blessed are the meek. Is that not revolutionary? Has not God chosen those who are poor in the eyes of the world, says James chapter 2, to be rich in faith and to inherit the kingdom that he has promised to those who love him? The gospel. The gospel is comfort to the afflicted. But this part brings little comfort and far more disruption to our settled ways. The last shall be first, and the first last, says Jesus. He's, he's actually speaking to the afflicted when he says, the last shall be first. Amen, Jesus. The last have held that position or maybe been held in that position for far too long. But in the kingdom, the last will be seen in a new light. They will be first. It's the comfortable, of course, he's addressing with the latter part of this verse. The first have too often elbowed out the weak and weary, the widowed and the orphan, the stranger and the homeless. The first will move to the back and give others a place that allows vision and hope for them. But when? In the life after? Certainly. But not only then. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. It's part of our inheritance as heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ to share what we have gained through grace with those whom mercy seeks. People whose inheritance is guaranteed can take all kinds of risks. You know as well as I do that it's time those of us who claim the name of Jesus and are part of his church take greater risks. To risk more and stand up for those whose lives are threatened daily, not only by homelessness and food insecurity or racism or bigotry, but, but yes, those and others. Individuals and families who have so little joy and confidence or self-worth or hope. Those who never feel they belong or are welcomed anywhere. Persons who have lost so much that they are beginning to feel they have nothing more to lose. What would you give away if you found out tomorrow that, well, that you had just inherited a truckload of money? I'm sorry, uh, that's not really my question, nor is it the question the gospel ever presents us with. 
because it's far too safe a question. It keeps most of us at a, a safe distance from a serious and more personal answer. So let me ask it again. Ask it another way to those of you who, who know Jesus as your forgiver and leader. What will you do tomorrow knowing that your future is secure, that your hope is eternal, that the king of the world has already adopted you as his own child and guarantees that you will have the riches of the kingdom. To borrow again the words of Fleming Rutledge, let's be reckless in the name of Christ. May the words of Matthew 25 verse 34 be, be words that you will hear spoken by the king, spoken to you. Come, O blessed of my Father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. Amen. Would you bow with me now in prayer? Let's pray. Eternal God, thank you seems too small a phrase to express all that we're feeling and experiencing as your adopted sons and daughters through Christ. And yet it is a beginning. 
It opens our hearts humbly before you, eager to give you praise and credit for bringing to us the things we would never have without Christ, for the forgiveness of our sins, for the strength of faith and the gift of salvation, for the promise of eternity. Oh Lord, thank you. We pray for all those in need and searching for what this world has not been able to provide. We pray for those lost in the chaos that leads one down endless dead-end roads. We pray for those who have lost so much they have almost given up. Lord, we know that you are already there beside us and beside them, and you have not abandoned them. May they feel right now the embrace of Jesus. May they experience the love of God. May they know the guarantee of your Holy Spirit assuring them of the inheritance that awaits those whom faith has claimed. In Christ, who overcame the limitations and the shortcomings of this world to open the very gates of heaven. We pray that those who are afflicted and listening today would feel the comfort that will provide them with deliverance from their struggles, temptations, or pain. And we pray boldly for those, including ourselves, who may be too comfortable that they and we might be afflicted with a discomfort that will motivate us to risk something for the Christ we love. Give us insight into the mission you have prepared for us. Give us the willingness to suffer for the glory yet to be revealed. We may not need to lay down our lives, but we truly seek, O oh God, to live a life that honors the one who laid down his life for us. Call to us again, Lord, wherever we are in the muddle of life, so that we can hear your voice and respond in faithful obedience, in simple trust, and an ever-deepening joy as we realize that you see us and as we open our hearts to you. This we pray in the powerful name of Jesus. Amen. Now may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord's face radiate with joy and be gracious unto you. May God lift up his countenance upon you and grant you his peace today and always. Amen. Peace like a river attendeth my way. When a sorrows like sea billows roll, whatever my lot thou hast taught me to say, it is well, it is well with my soul. It is well. my soul. It is well, it is well with my soul. Though Satan should buffet, though trials should come, let this blessed assurance control that Christ hath regarded my helpless estate and his shed his own blood for my soul it is well with my soul of this glorious thought my sin not in part but the whole is nailed to the cross and i bear it no more praise 
the Lord, praise the Lord, oh my soul, it is well with my soul, it is well, it is well with my soul. Haste the day when my faith shall be sight. The clouds be rolled back as a scroll. The trump shall resound and the Lord shall descend. Even so, it is well with my soul it is well with my soul it is well